Okay. Ready? Uh, welcome, everyone. Get my words out. Um, welcome to our 149th Reading Online Sports Economics Seminar. Uh, we have Thomas Busser from the University of Amsterdam uh, presenting the anatomy of competitiveness. Before he gets going, uh, there's a few uh, short announcements. Uh, you'll have seen in the reminder um, a tentative schedule for the new year. Um, and you may have noticed that the uh, the first talk in the new year on January the 12th uh, is as yet uh, not taken. So if anyone does want to uh, present in early January, what will be the 150th uh, Reading Online Sports Economic Seminar, uh, do please get in touch. There's plenty of conferences uh, being organised for the year ahead. Uh, and um, Thomas Peters, a uh, different Thomas uh, has shared with me the call for papers for the uh, European uh, Association of Sports Economists annual conference, which is going to be in. Um, I'm going to try and find. There we go. It's going to be in Rotterdam in uh, August. So hopefully you can see on my computer there the uh, call for papers. Uh, so the important dates uh, for the time being are March 15th to uh, for the deadline for your submission. Uh, extended abstract, but that's 21st to the 23rd of August in Rotterdam, the Erasmus School of Economics, the uh, 15th conference of the European Sport Economics Association. Uh, there's also um, a couple, well, I will quickly share one, uh, one more, uh, and I'll share the PowerPoint just so that it brings it up. Um, window and I won't go into full screen, but you can hopefully see the details there. Uh, there will be uh, the third Reading Football Economics Conference. Um, we've had a couple of those over the years, and we'll have the third one in May next year. Uh, and it will double up as the seventh Sport Economic Sports Management International Conference. So papers that aren't on football will be uh, acceptable. Uh, and papers that are on management and not economics will be acceptable as well. Uh, I will uh, share details uh, of that in due course. Uh, including a deadline for submissions, but May 7th, 8th here in Reading in the UK. Uh, many folk will be aware of the um, the Hihon Sport Economics Conference that's been running for many, many years now. I think it's the 18th year this year. That will take place uh, on the 10th and 11th of May. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you, from my own perspective, there's a direct flight from Gatwick Airport to Astorias, the airport near to Hihon. So travel from Reading if you were to come to Reading in May to Asturias will be uh, nice and relatively convenient. But I don't want to take up any more of uh, Thomas's time. Thomas, you've got mm -hmm. an hour, a bit more. Thomas is happy to take questions as, as he goes along. So uh, raise your hand uh, or interrupt Thomas. Uh, uh, but I don't want to talk any longer. Thomas, uh, please take away your talk. All right, let me share the, share the slides. But, uh, all right, you can see the slides? Yep, perfect. Okay, perfect. Yes, um, yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and for the, uh, for the invitation. So indeed the paper I'm going to present is called The um, Anatomy of Competitiveness. And um, so I'll be explaining in a second what, what exactly that means. And so this is joint work with uh, my colleague Hessel Osterbeek, and I'm also going to briefly talk about uh, during the introduction about uh, another uh, paper on competitiveness that we have written together with uh, Muriel Niedele, who's at Stanford uh, University. So um, I've been doing quite a lot of work on, on uh, preferences for competition, willingness to compete, uh, competitiveness, so people call it different names, and um, all of this basically fits within a, a larger um, literature in, in behavioral uh, economics, but also in um, education and labor economics that tries to um, estimate the effect or, or the importance of differences in economic preferences and personality traits um, in determining and influencing outcomes that, say, economists typically care about. Things like uh, labor market outcomes, income, uh, occupational choice, uh, educational attainment, um, and so on. So today, because this is a sports economic uh, economics seminar, I'll, I produced some bonus content. So I'm also going to talk about some uh, uh, sports outcomes. 
Um, so basically, this, this the idea um, behind this literature is that um, the economic choices we make in life, career choices um, that lead, um, you know, lead us on different career paths and determine our our income and our success in the labor market, are influenced by um, our preferences, our economic preferences, things like you know how risk seeking you are, how uh, patient you are. But also by our personality, right? Like things like personality traits, as defined by personality psychologists, like the big five personality traits: conscientiousness, or things like grit, right? Perseverance, and and so on. Um, and so the idea that um, there is something like preferences for competition that actually, uh, say, relative to something like risk aversion that really comes out of economic theory, um, this is not the case for competitiveness, but it's really something that came out of a um, much more applied um, experimental literature in behavioral economics. And that was initially um, in particular aimed at uh, showing whether there are gender differences in competitiveness. So the classic paper there, and I'll be talking about the design in a little bit, is by my co-author Muriel together with Lisa Westerlund, where they have a paper in the uh, 2007 paper in the um, Quarterly Journal of Economics that has been I don't know, cited, uh, I think, thousands of times by now, where um, they came up with a simple game to basically measure this idea of, of kind of preference, so willingness to compete or, or, or kind of aversion to competition with the result that they found this, this huge difference between men and women, at least in the lab, where, where on average, men were extremely attracted to competition, even when they their chances of winning were quite low. And um, women, even many women with very, very high chances of, of actually winning the competition decided not, not to enter it. Um, and um, these gender differences have been replicated many times in the lab, but also in, in some high stakes field uh, environments. So for example, I have a paper together with my uh, Dutch colleagues, um, uh, with a couple of Dutch colleagues here in, at, the, uh, at the Free University. Uh, Martijn van den Assem and, and Danny van Dolder, where we use game show data to show that even when there's hundreds of thousands of euros on the line, you, you do get this difference between men and women um, in, in kind of the willingness to kind of take a financial risk and, and, and go for a high price in a competition rather than taking a relatively small uh, opt out price. Um, and then, and this is the literature to in, in, in which kind of what I'm going to present today fits in. There's a follow-up literature to this that started asking the question. So, okay, so we, we do have these individual and gender differences in the lab, but of course this only matters if, if this preference for competing in the lab or maybe in a game show also correlates with what people will choose in their careers, right, in, in, in the labor market. Um, and there's a growing number of papers that kind of answer this in the affirmative way. So that, that kind of this small decisions that people make in the lab for relatively small sums of money actually do correlate uh, quite strongly with how much people money people earn, what kind of careers they choose, the study choices of, um, of high school students, for example, of university students and, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, yes, so as I said, what I'm going to present today it's mainly based on, uh, uh, on on this my recent working paper, the anatomy of competitiveness. Um, but this one is very much a follow up paper to um, a study together with uh, Muriel and Hessel um, that is also out as a working paper, which is called "Can Competitiveness Predict Education and Labor Market Outcomes: Evidence from Incentivized Choice and Survey Measures?" So I'll first be talking a little bit about that paper because that very much leads up to, um, to what we do in the anatomy of competitiveness paper. So basically the two papers together, the questions that we try to answer on top of this literature that I just mentioned is, so we do have quite a lot of evidence that um, competitiveness as measured through kind of incentivized games in the lab is predictive of, of important choices that people make outside of the lab. But these papers are typically based on relatively selected Samples, typically high school students, university students, sometimes um, there's one paper on MBA students, but it's typically typically based on student samples simply because it's easy to capture uh, uh, students right in a classroom or, or, or in the lab. So the first thing that we wanted to find out is whether um, competitiveness is still 
predictive of, of, of these important economics, economic and career outcomes if we use a nationally representative sample. And then to take this literature forward and kind of make it easier to, to measure competitiveness in large samples, uh, the second thing we were aiming at is to find a, a, a much simpler way to measure preferences for competition. Um, and we're by far not the first to do this, right? Um, I'll be talking about some other studies that have done similar things for risk preferences, time preferences, social preferences. But the idea is to um, come up with a, with a non-incentivized questionnaire item. So basically just asking people, right? How competitive are you on a scale from say one to 10, right? And to see whether we, uh, if we do this in the same sample, whether point one is predicts what people do in an incentivized choice, but also whether we can predict the same uh, education and labor market outcomes with such a questionnaire uh, measure. And if that's the case, then it will be much easier to, to elicit preferences for competition in, a, in, a, um, in, in large samples, right? Large survey panels that can maybe also be linked to administrative data and, and so on. And then if we, if we can find such a, such a questionnaire item, then another interesting question is so okay so so maybe competitiveness predicts outcomes and correlates with 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 labor market outcomes um but so do many other things right so there's a lots of papers on risk preferences on on social preferences self-esteem and in particular also on on for example the big five personality traits so another question we want to ask is like how strong how predictive is competitiveness relative to these other kind of established traits, right? So once we, if we also measure all these other traits, does that basically also capture the effect of competitiveness or the correlation, or is competitiveness something separate that we should be measuring on, on top of these other things? And then the, and then the fourth question, and this is uh, very much the, the anatomy question, is that so once, once we started working on this and presenting this work, um, one question we, we kept getting is, so, right, so you're measuring competitiveness, you're asking people how competitive they are, and, and, and this, predicts, um, this predicts their labor market outcomes, but what, is, what does competitiveness actually mean, right? So what do we actually measure both with the in, in incentivized question, but also with, with, with the survey item? If, if, if we elicit competitiveness, which, which by now hundreds of papers are trying to do, what are we actually measuring, right? And, and, and so I'll, we came up with a much more detailed questionnaire where we tried to get at this. So what, what what does it actually mean to be competitive, right? And, 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 and which aspects of competitiveness are actually correlated with these, uh, with these outcomes? Right, so um, the place where we, where we elicit our data is a representative Dutch survey panel, so-called LIS, uh, LIS panel. Um, this is a panel that is about the total population is about 7,000 people that have been chosen by um, statistics Netherlands to be, uh, according to some criteria at least, uh, representative of the Dutch uh, population. And um, this panel, so these people that are on this panel, they already um, answer monthly questionnaires. So there's a, a number of core questionnaires, so-called core questionnaires, that these people answer every year. So that every year they're asked about their economic situation, income, assets, and so on um their private situation family life education many things but also actually a quite detailed um personality questionnaire that we will be making use of that elicits for example the the big five personality traits and um so on top of these core questionnaires um researchers can actually uh, apply to include additional questions so this is mostly a question of paying for it so if you if you're willing to pay the price, basically you you can add questions to these uh, to these uh, standard questionnaires that these people already answer. So in um, quite a while ago now, in 2017, we added a very simple question to this survey panel, and this question was on this you know um, how co how competitive do you consider yourself to be? And please answer this question on a scale from zero, which means not competitive at all to 10, which means very competitive. So basically that's the question we asked. And then after that, we waited a whole year. And one year later, we took a subsample of the people who answered 
our uh, our one to ten a zero to ten question, and we run the actual incentivized experiment that people typically do in the lab with these people. And so the way this experiment works, and this has been, as I said, used in, in hundreds of probably thousands of papers by now, is um, a variant of the following. So basically, people um, who participate in the experiment, they have to perform in some kind of real effort task, and they can earn money for their, um, for their performance. So in the original um, needle Levesselin paper, this was the task consisted in adding up numbers, so we didn't want to use this online simply because people could uh, take out a calculator and, uh, and and cheat. So what we did is we presented people with um, a three times three grid of, of nine two digit numbers. And people had to as quickly as possible identify the two numbers that added up to 100. And then people got two minutes and in these two minutes they could solve as many of these simple math problems as they could, right? And then the more they, more of these problems they solved, the, the more money they would earn. Um, what varies across the rounds is the way they were paid for their performance. So in round one, people received a piece rate. Um, so in our case, this was 40 cents per correctly solved matrix. Then in round two, they were in a tournament with somebody else. So they didn't know who, they just knew there's another uh, uh, survey panel respondent with whom their performance would expose be compared. And um, if they would win the competition, they would uh, earn double. They would earn 80 cents per correctly solved matrix. Um, but they would earn nothing if they, if, 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 they, if, if they lost the competition. And then the interesting part is round three, where people had to choose between these, these two compensation schemes. And as I said, so this has been used in, in, in a very large uh, experimental economics literature. And in this literature, typically the aim was, was to estimate differences between men and women in this choice. Right? So that's not necessarily our focus here, um, but that so far this has been the typical measure of, of willingness to compete used, used in the literature. So this has a few disadvantages. Um, disadvantage number one is that it's a binary choice. So it's a fairly crude measure of, 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 of competitiveness. Point two, of course, whether you compete or not doesn't only depend on your preferences for competition. It also depends on how good you are at the task. It depends on how good you think you are at the task, right? Your confidence. It depends on your risk preferences and, uh, uh, and many other things. And then, um, so once, as I said, once we started uh, working on this and presenting this work, we started to get more and more questions about um, other traits this could be correlated with. And in particular, also people started asking um, a bit like, yeah, what exactly competitiveness is, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that later. So we started diving into the uh, psychology literature on, on different competition scales. And we collected additional data in 2021, where we asked people much more detailed questions about their uh, uh, preferences for competition, but also collected a few additional preferences and personality traits that were not yet in the in the list data. Okay. So the first um, the first question to ask, of course, about our um, non incentivized survey item question is in how far it is actually correlated with um, with the experimental choice. So there's a literature. Um, so I think like the first paper that has been trying to do something like this in economics is the paper by Do uh, Thomas Dolman and co-authors in 2011 in the Journal of the European Economic Association, where they validate a very simple measure for uh, risk preferences, which very much inspired our competitiveness measure. So basically, those are just ask people like on a, on a scale from zero to 10, how risk seeking are you? And what they show is that this measure is very predictive of, of, of economic outcomes, but it also correlates quite nicely with typical lottery choice measures of, um, of economic preferences, of, of, of risk preferences. So the first thing to do is to show that um, that these, these two, this zero to 10 measure, right? And, and, and this uh, binary choice measure that were collected one year apart are actually correlated with each other. And, and that's the case. So, so stati they're statistically very significantly correlated with each other. Um, so of course, by waiting a whole year in between, the, that, that makes the correlation weaker 
than uh, if we would have done what most other papers do and just ask this on the same day or maybe with a, with a week in between. But the correlation is still sizable. But we can actually go one step further in validating this question than, than just showing that it's correlated with the binary choice, because in the end, we actually think uh, by asking people uh, a more fine grained question, we actually get better information about their competitiveness than with the binary choice. But what we can do is we can we can correlate both of these measures with the same uh, economic outcomes that we expect to correlate with competitiveness and see whether they both uh, uh, predict the same outcomes. And that's basically the results that I would that I'm, I'm going to show you now before I start getting into this more detailed anatomy of competitiveness question. So basically what we show in our first working paper is that um, both of these measures are strong predictors of, of income, occupation, and, and I'm not going to show you this today, but also of, of, of education, uh, educational outcomes. So what you see here is basically for people just controlling for absolutely nothing, but for, for men and women separately, um, the, the income right, in quintiles for people that uh, chose the competition and for people who chose the piece rate in the incentivized experiment. So what you see in, in red is that amongst people who chose the competition, that these people are much more likely than people who chose the piece rate to be in the highest income quintile. And these are income quintiles of the income distribution in our sample, right, for men and women separately. And they're much less likely to be in the lower income quintiles relative to, to people who chose the piece rate. So this is just a, it's a pure correlation controlling for absolutely nothing, right? People who chose the competition in the experiment, they're earning a, a, a significantly more money. And then we can compare this, that's what you see below, with people who, um, with a larger sample who answered the, the, the questionnaire measures. So of course, if we want to do a similar graph, we have to somehow divide these people into two groups. So what we did here is just split them, whether they scored themselves as above or below median competitive. So whether they said, I think the median was about six. So if they said I'm above six competitive or below six competitive, right? And we see the same pattern. So people who see, say that I'm competitive, they, they tend to be in the higher income quintiles and people who say I'm, I'm not competitive, they tend to be uh, uh, have an income in the lower quintiles. So of course, again, this is controlling for nothing. Um, I'm gonna show you here regression results where we control for things like so the first uh, in, in the first column for uh, just uh, gender, age, education level, uh, and and um, and this how well they how, how highly they scored in the task. That's the one reason why people who choose competition in the task could earn more money is simply because they're smarter people who do better at the task, right, or have higher education levels. Um, so we control for this, uh, and then in the second column we additionally control for. Um, other economic preferences and, and personality traits. And then on the left, we do this for the experiment, and on the right, we do this for the questionnaire question. And what we see is that even if we control for all these factors, we still have, still have a very strong correlation between um, people's income and, and competitiveness as measured by either of these, of these two measures. And then um, the second thing we ask, okay, so, so people earn more, is this because they, they are in different in different uh, uh, occupations. So one one thing that uh, one, one of the predictions or kind of implicit predictions of, of the of the experimental literature on competitiveness is simply that people who like to compete, right, they will move up the the corporate hierarchy. They will be found in management positions and in, 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 in more prestigious uh, uh, occupations. So what we have in the list panel is that actually the panel asks people to um, classify their own occupation in different categories. And uh, the ones that are very interesting for us, I think especially are the um, people who say, yes, I'm in a, in a higher supervisory category. So basically I'm, a, I'm in upper management. So that's here completely on the right. Um, also interesting are higher academic and independent occupations. So these are prestigious occupations, things like um, architect, lawyer, doctor, uh, professor also. Um, and so on, and then we have other categories that 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 are progressively 
less uh, less prestigious, right? They're kind of intermediary occupations, uh, manual occupations, unskilled occupations. And again, um, what we see here is that the people who who say that I am I'm either in upper management or I have a prestigious occupation, they're uh, um, so the people, sorry, that people who basically chose the competition, right? They're much, much more likely to say that they have such an occupation relative to people who chose the piece rate. And then again, we can also look at this for people who scored themselves highly on competitiveness on our on our survey item, and we say exa see exactly the same pa uh, pattern, right? So the people who scored themselves said, yes, I'm a very competitive person. They're much more likely to have one of these prestigious occupations, and 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 they're much less likely to be in a, in a, in a in a less highly regarded uh, profession. And the same thing. So so the, and and these associations are still very strong and and, and statistically significant. If we if we control for um, for education, gender, age, but also for a range of other personality traits. Thomas, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, has a hand up with a question. Um, yeah, Thomas, I was just wondering um, with the occupation question, was it yeah. like just a standard question about what kind of, I mean, what were the categories they could choose from there? Yeah, so it's basically these these categories here. And then they, so they, 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 they but the explanations were more detailed, right? So they said um, for each of the, so it's, it's, higher, um, it's higher supervisory, higher academic independent, super intermediate supervisory, intermediary academic independent other mental things so that there's like accounting secretary stuff like that uh, skilled manual and and unskilled um and then but then actually so so in the questionnaire the the, quest, the the description is quite detailed so for each of these there will be several examples right of what that means and and okay. what it means to have such an occupation right that you're in charge of people and then the list of uh, of of examples of occupations that would fit uh, within the category. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right. So um, basically, what I showed you is that even on, on on top of like, for example, the big five personality traits and and risk aversion and and and, and self confidence, um, competitiveness predicts these outcomes. So the next question that we wanted to ask in, 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 in our paper is, so, so, so it's predictive, but relatively speaking, how predictive is it compared to these, these, other, these other personality traits and preferences that actually the literature has traditionally been interested in? So there's a lot of papers in, in educational economics, for example, that look at the big five personality traits, right? So for example, James Heckman has a lot of papers um, saying that uh, uh, the trait of conscientiousness, right? So how reliable you are and how much you stick to your plans and and and, and don't give up uh that this that this trait correlates extremely strongly with with uh, uh, success in school uh, for children or, or, or already so what we're going to do here is we um we're just going to compare for each of the traits um people in in the top 30 percent of this trait to people in the bottom 30 percent of the trait on these outcomes that i just showed you Right, so we're going to ask like how much more money do people earn that are in the top 30 percent of competitive people compared to the bottom 30 percent how much money do people earn who are the top 30 percent conscientious people compared to the bottom 30 percent conscientious people right? um and that's what you see here on the um on, on this graph right so we have a, from the left to right we have competitiveness we have the big five personality traits extroversion agreeableness, conscientiousness, mental stability, so it's the opposite of being neurotic, intellectual openness. We have uh, risk preferences, so how risk-seeking are you, right? We have general confidence and we have a, a self-esteem scale. And um, so what this shows you is basically that um, competitiveness is one of the strongest, out of these kind of standard traits, right? Competitiveness is, is one of the strongest predictors of, of of how much money you earn so right all, all of these are, are are just conditional correlations um yeah so unfortunately we also find like many many other papers too that uh, agreeableness right being nice is, is 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 negatively correlated with with income conditional on the other traits um and then we can also do this for um having a high high level 
prestigious occupation, and we find kind of the same thing, right? So competitiveness is, is one of the best predictors of, of relative to these other personality traits and preferences of, of, of having, a, having a high level occupation. And then because this is a sports economic seminar, I promised some uh, bonus content, right? So it turns out that if you want to know, if you want to find a personality trait that predicts whether somebody uh, practices sports, then competitiveness is also by far the, the, the best one to, uh, the best one to know. So now we get to this anatomy part of competitiveness. So the open question is a little bit, so we have this binary choice and we have this zero to 10 question. And both of them conditional on many other personality traits and on, on things like education, gender, age, they are very predictive of occupational choices, success in the labor market. In the paper we showed that they also correlate very strongly with, with education level and, and a bunch of other things. So the question that then comes up is a little bit, what, what, what do we pick up by competitiveness? Um, and for example, colloquially, if you think, for example, so I have, I have two children. Um, if we look at, you know, if people say, oh, my child is very competitive. That can in a way mean one of two things. So it can either mean that they really enjoy competition, but we also call people competitive if they are basically just have to show all the time that they're the best, right? And, 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 and maybe are even bad losers. And these can be very two different, very, very different things, right? So I can enjoy participating in competition regardless of the outcome. It's just fun for me. Or maybe I don't really enjoy the competition, but I have this urge to always show that I'm the winner, that I'm the best, right? That I'm not a loser. Um, and another question we, we kept getting is also, yeah, so maybe competitiveness is just a manifestation of some general willingness to, to seek challenges, right? And confront challenges. So maybe um, I don't really care about competition, but maybe I just like challenges and, and competition is a challenge. So, so I, I, I go for it. And then, and this, this is mainly with respect to this literature on the, on the difference between men and women, but there are several papers that argue that a lot of that difference is not actually due to any kind of taste of competition, but to some kind of combination of risk preferences and, and, uh, and beliefs and confidence. So what we're going to try to do is in, in, a, in, a, in a much more thorough way, ask people more detailed questions to kind of separate these, these different things from each other, check which of these is picked up by the binary choice measure and by our survey measure, and which of these actually predicts outcomes, right? And in, 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 in which direction. Um, so what we did is we, we started uh, uh, diving into the literature, um, the psychology literature, and also the business literature uh, to look for competitiveness scales. So it turns out there are several, although none of these really ever like took off in the sense of like, for example, the, the big five personality traits, right? Um, um, but so basically we, we base our um, questionnaire mainly on the paper by Diego Orbic and, and co-authors. And what they did basically, so they did this in a way for us. So they, they went around and they looked for different competitiveness scales. And so on top of this idea of enjoyment of competition and desire to win, which I already mentioned, which was kind of our starting point, um, they also integrated questions on what they call competition for personal development motives. And what that means is basically, so I'm motivated to compete because comp competing helps me get better at something. So if I want to become a really good chess player, the only way to do this is basically compete against others in chess. So I don't care about the competition so much. I don't care about winning, but I just want to become better. And that's the way, and competition helps me doing this, right? And on top of it, we added a couple of general uh, challenge seeking questions to, to differentiate competitiveness from this general challenge seeking. Right? And, and, we, and we asked this in the same panel that we, we did our experiment and, and we asked our general question. No. So I'm not going to read out all the different questions to you, but just so you get a feeling of, of, of how we elicited these different aspects. Um, so enjoyment of competition is just questions like I enjoy competing against others, right? Um, 
or then also in the negative, right? I find competitive situations unpleasant. Personal development motives for competing uh, is questions such as I can improve my competence by competing, right? And uh, um, competition allows me to judge my level of, of competence. And then desire to win, kind of this idea of, of I just have to show that I'm the best, right? Is questions such as I, I often try to outperform others. Um, and to this, we actually added one question to the to the questionnaire that we took over from the other paper. And that's that I this kind of idea of being a bad loser, right? So I, I find losing very, very painful. Um, and then challenge seeking, which is ask people uh, two statements. I always look for new challenges and I enjoy working on challenging tasks. And then because um, so we had a few of these personality traits already in the list data. I said that, the, for example, the big five personality traits, but we we now in, in, for this project collected a few um, additional personality traits, in particular uh, grit, uh, which is related to conscientiousness, but it's very much measuring the idea of being very perseverant, not giving up, um, uh, uh, sticking to your plans, and uh, 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 some measures of, of social preferences taken by, from the work of Armin Falcon co-authors uh, that are just questions uh, that elicit uh, trust, reciprocity, uh, uh, um, uh, altruism, and so on. So the first thing in terms of this anatomy of competitiveness Right, that 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 we that sticks out is that actually these different aspects of competitiveness, so the enjoyment, this uh, competition for development motives, desire to win, and challenge seeking, that they're they're actually extremely correlated with each other. And that's a little bit less true for challenge seeking, but it's very true for these uh, three uh, different uh, competitiveness aspects. So if you put them separately into a regression, let's say, the correlations with outcomes will always go in the same direction. So what I'm going to show you mainly is uh, regressions where we put them simultaneously. But it's one thing to keep in mind is, although um, it may be, there's a difference right between enjoying competition and always having to be the best, these two things are actually extremely correlated with each other. So the first question we ask, what we want to know is like, okay, so we have these other measures of competitiveness, right? The general question and the binary choice. So what do they pick up? Do they pick up enjoyment of competition? Do they pick up uh, uh, this, this kind of needs to win? Do they pick up general challenge seeking? So that's what, what I'm answering in kind of with, with these regressions here. So what you see is that the, the strongest correlations is are with enjoyment and need to win. And so these two things are kind of equally predictive of what people will answer if you just ask them how competitive are you on a scale from zero to 10. And what you see on the right is in particular, if you control for other personality traits, and here we have really quite a, a long list of other personality traits, the correlation with challenge seeking becomes much weaker. So it seems that this general challenge seeking is actually quite well already picked up by other standard personality traits like grit and, and, and the big five personality traits. So basically, then, especially conditional on these other traits, the, the general question mainly picks up a mix of, of enjoyment of competition and, and the desire or need to, to win. And this actually looks quite similar if we look at the experimental binary choice measure. So now it's also like, I think one thing that's worth emphasizing here. So at this point, there's, there's about four years between uh, this experiment, right, and asking this other questionnaire, and 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 despite that, despite this, we still get uh, we still get quite strong correlations. So it it does seem to be also the case that competitiveness is a fairly stable, stable uh, uh, personality trait. So, but again, if we look at this, right, so it's mainly picking up some. So people who say I enjoy competing, they're more likely to enter the competition, and people who say like yeah, I I I just always have to be the best, right, they they're also more likely to enter, but not people, uh, at least conditional on the other three, right? people who say just generally I like challenges, that doesn't seem to be the thing that's driving uh, competition entry in the experiment. So instead of more, um, instead of more um, numbers, I'm just gonna show you the regression results as, as heat maps, basically. So what we did is we, regressed a bunch of different outcomes 
um, on these four aspects of competitiveness, right? Enjoyment of competition, competing for personal development, desire to win, and general challenge seeking. And then on the left, you see results from regressions where we put these uh, separately. And on the right is regressions where we put four of them simultaneously. And then another thing that we wanted to do on top of um, our first paper is to ask not only, um, okay, so does competitiveness predict success in the labor market, but we also wanted to see a bit whether whether it, cor it also correlates with personal well-being. So we also, uh, on top of income and, and occupation, we also look at outcomes such as uh, what I'm showing you here is for example, happiness. So there's just individual happiness uh, 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 judged on a scale from zero to 10. Um, uh, indicator of career satisfaction. So basically just asking people how satisfied they are with their career. And closeness is basically a measure of how close people generally feel to other people. So we wanted to get some idea of, is it the case that then, you know, super competitive people are just less socially integrated, have fewer friends and, and, and so on. And I think the interesting results uh, to focus on are the ones on the right, where we put the um, the, the four uh, traits simultaneously. And what you see there is that if we look at income, right, both enjoying competition and being obsessed about winning and being the best, um, and also general challenge seeking, right, they're all positively associated with, with income. But if you look at happiness, that's actually not the case, right? So people who say, I enjoy competing, they tend to be much more happy than people who say I don't enjoy competing, but it's the opposite for this for this needs to win and be the best, right? So people with a strong desire to outperform others, they're actually less happy on average. They're less satisfied with their careers, and they also say that they feel less close to to other people relative relative to people, right? And 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 this is really the goes in the opposite direction than people who say I enjoy competing or I just enjoy uh, challenges in um, in general. And so we have a bunch of uh, uh, further outcomes here. Um, so some by this, uh, these are all binary indicators, it's basically indicators for being in a management position, uh, for being uh, uh, as management is upper management, any kind of supervisory position, um, being in a, in a prestigious professional position, being an entrepreneur, which is a bit, um, so the problem here is that there's not that many true entrepreneurs in the sample, so we don't include self-employed people. It's really people that are um, leading a company that they themselves own and that that has employees. And and that's uh, and then as another indicator of um, say more objective indicator maybe of of well-being, we have a, a, an indicator of whether people take medication for depression or anxiety. And again, we kind of find a similar similar patterns as as before, right? So if we look at the, on the left where we put these things simultaneously, then all, all all of them predict success in the labor market, right? So so if you're more competitive, you're more likely to be a manager, more likely to be in a supervisory position, more likely to be an entrepreneur. Um, but if you put them simultaneously, it becomes very clear that um, while both enjoyment and and winning kind of correlate with more success. Um, uh, enjoyment again, right? Makes you it makes actually much less. So people who say I enjoy competing, they're much less likely to say uh, I, I have to take uh, medication against depression or anxiety. Whereas people who say like you know I I have this strong need to be the best all the time, they're actually more likely to uh, to need medication. All right, and then uh, so I, I again promised some bonus content, so I also did this here. So I also like I, I did this a couple of days ago out of my own curiosity also. Um, so we saw that um, the simple zero to 10 question, right, is extremely predictive of, of doing sports. So if you look at the, the first row, so basically this is just the binary indicator uh, of other people in the in the survey panel said that they practice any sport. And then we see that either of these four measures is significantly associated Right with 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 saying that that you practice sports. So as, as a reference, about half of the people in the panel say that they practice sports. But then actually, people are asked also very in a very detailed way what kind of sport that they um, that they practice. And so we can also see like you know competitive which sports do the most competitive people do. 
So it turns out that that seems to be um, in the Netherlands as so a hockey is very big. So this means this doesn't mean ice hockey. This means field hockey. So apparently people who are very competitive, they enjoy field hockey, apparently also golf. So that could maybe be because they're more likely to be managers, um, also gymnastics, um, but they're actually less likely to do to be into dancing or, or, or yoga. Right. But again, right, so apart from predicting um, all kinds of career outcomes, uh, competitiveness is uh, maybe not so surprisingly a, a very good predictor of, of, of whether people enjoy sports. All right, so the last thing I would like to, um, to talk about, because um, also because this is a, something the literature has focused on um, to a really large extent, the competitiveness mm -hmm. literature, is, um, is this idea of gender differences in, in competitiveness, right? And whether they can explain, and explain here is really meant in a very correlational sense, right? If we control for competitiveness, does that explain away some of the differences between men and women that we observe in the, in the labor market? So what you see here on this slide is just simply that in our sample, we observe some of the, of the differences we typically observe, right? So women in our sample earn much less money on average. So this is also because in the Netherlands, women tend to work part-time a lot. So it's not, these are not hourly earnings, right? These are monthly uh, earnings. Um, they're much less likely to say that they work in a management or supervisory position. They are less likely to work in one of these prestigious professional occupations that I mentioned, and they're much less likely to, to be an entrepreneur, right? To, to, to be uh, basically a director of a company that they own and, and that employs other people. Um, so I didn't show you this, but also all of these four measures of, of competitiveness and challenge seeking that we have also significantly differ between men and women. And the biggest difference is actually for enjoyment of competition. So the question is now, if we just run a regression of, of these outcomes on a gender dummy, how much does the gender effect shrink if we, if we include our, our competitiveness measures? And that's basically what you see here, right? So, so bigger squares mean bigger percentage reduction in the, in, in the gender gap in the outcomes, right? So when you look at income, management position, supervisory position, professional position, uh, and being an entrepreneur. And um, now basically we run regressions controlling for age and education level um, and gender with and without introducing these competitiveness measures, right? And then we, we compare the gender coefficient. So what we see is that, um, is, is that for each of these, right? We, we, apart from being a professional, we get some, we get typically get significant reductions, statistically significant reductions in the, in the, in the gender difference if we include uh, our measures. Um, typically enjoyment of competition, uh, also because this is the one with the biggest gender difference, also causes the biggest reduction. Um, but what you see in the fifth column is that if you put all four of them together, right, typically you get a bigger reduction. So it does seem to be the case that and then on the total right, we just put a simple zero to 10 question. So what this tells us is that if, if you have the time and the survey space, it's, it's worth um, eliciting several questions right, to, to measure somebody's competitiveness rather than just a single question. You get bigger, bigger explanatory uh, power. Right, um, oh no, so actually it was not the last thing. This is the last thing. So one, one thing that could also be interesting to, to look at is, okay, um, so we have these four new kind of measures of different aspects of competitiveness and challenge seeking. Which other um, classic personality traits do these correlate with, right? So these are all simultaneous regressions. Um, on the left, you see uh, things like risk taking, confidence, uh, social preferences, and um, cognitive skills. And on the right is a few, uh, it's, it's, it's more personality traits coming out of the personality literature. So we have grit, we have the big five personality traits. And we also, um, we thought it was fun, in a follow-up questionnaire, we also co uh, uh, collected the so-called dark traits. So basically, I don't know if you're familiar with the dark triad, but it's this idea, so there's a big literature in, in personality psychology that basically says, okay, so the, 
you know, people claim that the big five traits kind of describe your personality quite thoroughly, but actually that's not the case. There's kind of, in particular, they're kind of some, some more dark traits that are not well captured by the big five. Um, that's the idea. So, for the, so the three, they're called narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. So Machiavellianism that refers to a tendency to manipulate other people, right? So we kind of know what the narcissist is. Um, psychopathy basically means being a, so this doesn't mean to be like a full blown clinical level psychopath, right? This means this is a continuous measure that basically, uh, uh, and then it's really astonishing that people answer these questions honestly, but they seem to do that. Um, that, that kind of measures in how far you kind of don't care about other people or only see other people's as people as instruments for your own success, right? Kind of, um, so lots of different, lots of different associations. I think in, in general, what, what, what pops out again is uh, I would say there's two things that pop out. One is that enjoying competition is really related to other traits in a very different way than needing to win or competing to prove something to yourself, right? To, to kind of get better or, or measure your own success. So typically we would probably say that enjoyment is kind of correlated with nicer personality traits. Um, so kind of being more extroverted, willing to take risk, more confident, right? Whereas uh, if we look at um, need to win, right? And then that's kind of, for example, correlated with narcissism, um, with less mental stability, uh, with being less agreeable. And then another thing that pops out is that, uh, again, this general challenge seeking is much more correlated with classic uh, preferences and personality traits than these other three aspects. Right? And this actually, we, we can also show this simply by regressing these four measures on all the other personality traits. And what we see is that the R squared for challenge seeking is about three times as high as for the others, right? meaning that Challenge seeking is relatively well picked up by traits that people have been measuring for a long time, much better than, than competitiveness uh, it, it itself. Right? So that's basically, um, basically what I have. Um, so to summarize, um, so I think like, so, and there's, I, I have, if you're interested in this, quite a few other papers that try to, to show this, but, um, so willingness to compete seems to be a trait that is not well captured by other economic preferences and, and measures and, and, and personality measures. And that is um, very strongly correlated with labor market outcomes that typically labor economists and education economists uh, care about a lot. Um, then, um, so if we measure willingness to compete, what exactly do we pick up? So basically we pick up some kind of mix of um, enjoying competition and some kind of need to win or be or, or also being a bad loser and also partially it's just a general willingness to take uh, uh, to confront challenges. Um, and then interestingly, right, if you look at enjoyment of competition and the need to win, then both of these correlate with more success in the labor market, but they predict well-being and, and, and life satisfaction, career satisfaction in, 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 opposite, um, in opposite directions. All right. Um, yeah, so that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Thomas. We have lots and lots of time for questions and comments. I am just going to give you a team's round of applause. Uh, and um, yeah, anyone with any questions and comments, please do put your hand up. Stefan has his hand up. Hi, Thomas. Um, that's it's a really interesting paper and uh, very thought provoking. Um, so I guess my my question is that I so as you were talking, I kept thinking about causality, and you know, that's mm -hmm. the thing I sort of was kept coming back to as, I, as you were talking. And so then I looked at your, as I was just looking at your discussion paper and I did a word search for causality and it doesn't appear once in the text, but I looked at, <laughs> then, I thought, then I looked at the word prediction and I, it appears 24 times in the text. So you have been really, really careful about this. And so you, you must be expecting this causality question because 
you've obviously thought about it. So the, the, the issue I would have is, um, I, I, it seems to me that, that what job you're in and, your, uh, and the perception of how competitive you are is jointly determined. And I wouldn't think that causality, I would be reluctant to say that causality was running from one to the other. Um, it seems to me that these are all socially determined in some way. And by a very early age, somebody's telling me, oh, I'm very, you're very competitive, or you're very this, you're very that. And so these things, so in that sense, yeah, okay, maybe if you ask people these questions, you could, you can predict, fine, but you don't really have a causal story, do you? Or do you? Um, no, so, so I, I, in particular, right, so the, the results I presented today that are from the survey panel, they're extremely correlational, and especially also because these people are already in the in the labor market. Some of them for a long time, and some of them are actually already retired, right? And and so so actually for the income measures, right, for the income outcomes, we 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 limit it to people that are still still of working age. But but you know some of them have been working in 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 in, in whatever career for forty years, right? And, and that kind of influenced their perception of their own competitiveness. So there actually it's it's it's. Um, I think much more useful, and, and again, this I'm not saying this clearly identifies causality, but it's much more useful actually in that sense to look at these at these previous papers that I mentioned, where and I have I have a couple of these where you measure competitiveness in 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 for example secondary school students at a moment where they haven't yet been tracked into different levels, right, and and then measure it at that time and then and then see you know does that predict future choices of these people. So again, that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't mean that competitiveness is the thing that causes their their other choices. But at least there they haven't made the choice yet. So at least it, it cannot have been because they went to study math later on, or or or, or something else that's prestigious that that influenced their competitiveness, right? Like the experience of doing it. But but in general, it's mm -hmm, yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, I, I would come back. Wouldn't psychologists argue that you know, even by the age of one or two, pretty much your much of your much of your social position has been determined? I mean, I, I mean, I, another thing that came to me about this was that that I mean, when I was growing up in England in the nineteen sixties and seventies, to say that you were a competitive individual has a very different meaning than it has today. Um, back then, it was a little bit frowned upon. You know, you don't want to be too mm -hmm. competitive. It's not really a good trait in a human being. You ought to be more amenable, less less aggressive. And you know, we've we uh, you know, I've lived through an era where suddenly being competitive is particularly living in the United States. That's really good. You've got to be competitive, and yes, that's really great. And that's a good. So in that sense, the the, the perception of these words has actually is highly contingent on the time and place in which you happen to live. And so uh, one problem is, you know, this relates to what Dutch people for four or five years ago, is this, does this, I mean, can you, can you extend this to any other contexts or any other social um, yeah. structures? How do you, how do you go about that? Yeah, so I'm actually, uh, uh, so l l luckily you're answering, you're asking me this question now and not three months ago. So I'm currently working on a working paper with colleagues in Norway that uh, hopefully in a two or three months will be out, where what we did is we collected basically the, the simple, like, you know, how competitive are you question uh, from representative samples in 62 countries. So and at least a thousand people in each country. So basically what we can do there is we can see like, you know, so how universal are these associations between competitiveness and income, competitiveness and education level and competitiveness and gender, for example. And there we find, so one thing we find is that in all but one country in the world, we find that men score themselves as more competitive than women, right? In all but three or four countries, people who say they're more competitive earn significantly more money. So it seems that some of these associations at least are fairly universal across. And, and, and these are countries uh, uh, basically covering all five continents. Right? So there are lots of countries in Africa, South America, Asia. I guess, I guess, I guess my bottom line question comes down to the, well, the sort of worry I have is, is this, that um, what is this for? Um, you know, if, if we have a survey of do you like chocolate, 
we can have, <laughs> once we determine that everybody likes chocolate, we can actually increase the supply of chocolate and that would be a good thing and increase social welfare. What mm -hmm. is this for? Why do we want to know this? And what are we going to do once we know that being competitive is highly correlated with getting good jobs? Are we going to try to make people more competitive? Is that what this is about? I mean, where, where are we going? Yeah, no, so, so I think like, you know, so, um, no, so that's, a, that's, a, that's also a question that comes up like very, very, uh, uh, and very justifiably so um, because of this whole literature on gender differences in competitiveness, right? So like when people often say like, sorry, what you're actually saying is that we have to make women more competitive, right? Or people in general, or, so I think like generally that's, that's I, I think for any personality trait, a bit like the, the wrong answer. So because point one, I, I think it's very hard to change people's personality and then point two right yeah it's like you know tends to be quite stable over time right so i don't think we're like even so there, there's lots of evidence right that even parents have very little impact on the personality of their children we believe twin studies so if, if like you know kind of raising your children for like 20 years right hardly has any impact on their personality right then it's maybe hard to come up with like small interventions to make people more competitive or extroverted or whatever. But then the second issue, like even if we could do that for competitiveness, it's really not clear whether that's socially desirable, right? Like is, is, it, is, it, is it good to make people more competitive, right? So it, 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 it's maybe they work harder, right? But like, is, 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 is it good for other things? Like maybe not, right? So I think maybe a, 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 a more interesting question to, 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 to ask ourselves, right? Is that, so, um, for example, in companies, like is, is it something we want to do, right? Do we actually want to always promote the most competitive, right? So clear, clearly, if, if, if depending on how you structure promotions, it, it will it, it will be the most competitive that will go for it, right? And 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 the more competitive you make it, right, the, your 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 say corporate environment, the more you will attract competitive people. So I also have several projects that go a bit in the, in this direction, right? So like, what what do you actually get? What, who do you attract, right? With with competitive incentives. So maybe another question to ask is also like by in 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 to what extent do we want that right so do we want competitive so so that's also that's why I think it's interesting to look at a bit with what what other traits competitiveness is correlated with yeah i mean i i mean is it isn't there a real risk that i mean um this is like the being the Oppenheimer of the corporate world, right? You're going to create, you're going to identify that that um, people with competitive traits are the ones who are going to be successful. And what's going to happen is that comp corporations who, you know, they only want to make money. That's their only role. So they will select out people who are with highly competitive traits. And whatever, you know, in, in a sense, you enable this kind of world where um, hyper competitiveness is prized above all, and um, everybody is forced into seeking seeking this, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not I'm not so sure about this, right? So I mean, now, now I'm going to talk again about other projects of mine, but uh, I, I now I'm, I'm currently working on several projects um, that kind of look at um, so like you know competitiveness, willingness to compete in. In, in fair and unfair settings. And, and is it the case that people are willing to compete in a fair setting also like willing to compete when it's unfair and even like kind of engage in unfair practices, right? So there's also research by other people that shows that like, you know, people are very willing to sabotage each other in, in, in competitions. And, and, and actually, so what we find in, 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 a, in another project, for example, is that people are willing to to enter fair competitions, is also quite willing to enter competitions in situations where it's actually detrimental, where there are like externalities, where where actually uh, their opponent has been handicapped and so on. So the question is, so so you say making money, right? So if you make money for yourself, right? So, so on average, people say they're very competitive, right? And even the people who kind of have this, you know, I just need to be the best, right? They they earn more money, but it's not clear that they make more money for their for their employers, right? So if you have somebody who's unwilling to cooperate with others and just wants to win the competition for themselves, that's not necessarily something that's good for the, for the employer, right? Hmm. I should let somebody else interrogate you, but, uh, <laughs> but I, 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 it's, it, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, that's obviously very interesting. Thanks. These, these are important questions. Thanks, Stefan. Um, 
Which is the one country, by the way, Thomas, where women are more competitive than men? Uh, China. China. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny enough, it's also the, um, there are a few uh, experimental papers from China so that were published before where they also find this. So they, they, they don't find this, this gender difference in competitiveness for like high school students, for example, in China or university students. Mm -hmm. And then there's the papers that argue that has something to do with communism, with the uh, one child policy. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you mentioned you have two kids. My instinct is to think about my own upbringing with my brother and sister and how competitive my brother was. Uh, and also, like you say, how competitive my kids are. I mean, I don't know to what extent you do these studies control for number of siblings. Does that have an effect on how competitive people are? Yeah, I've looked at so not in our survey data. It doesn't seem uh, that's something that I kind of expected to find. So at some point I started to play around with this, but um, I think there is. Yeah, I, I, again, I would have to actually look at this in our data because I think in the survey data we we could find we know whether people have male or female siblings, right? So there are some arguments that if you if you grow up so that girls growing up with a male sibling might do different things that girls to grow up with a female so i've, I've seen things about um uh, study choices and career choices so that kind of that women who grow up with a male sibling are choose more traditional occupations than than those who only up, grow up with female siblings stuff like that mm -hmm. but yeah should open up to uh, others in the audience that have got questions. Henrik. Yeah, um, thanks, Thomas. Uh, very inspiring talk. Um, okay. I've got a question related to um, the first part of um, the presentation where you present this um, experiment. So it's mm -hmm. uh, like in the Niederle Westerlund uh, paper, it's about solving math uh, tasks. And um, we wouldn't say this is perfectly gender neutral, right? So yeah. um, what do you think? I mean, there is, if I recall this co uh, correctly, there are um, papers showing that the extents of the gender differences is in the willingness to compete depend on the, the kind of task. So creative task, language task, math task. So, so what do you say about this? Yeah, so, so the evidence is a bit mixed if you look at the whole literature. So there are indeed some papers that look at tasks that are supposedly more stereotypically female. Um, so, for example, word typically word related tasks, and then some papers find that then the the this gender difference becomes smaller. And uh, but some papers also don't find that, so they still find quite a big difference even for. But but on average, for sure, I think if you would so I've I haven't done this right, but I think if you would do a meta study of all studies, then if you take less stereotypically male tasks, the difference would become smaller. Right? But people don't only find it for math, right? So, so you typically also find it for any kind of physical task. So people have done like, you know, throwing balls into a bucket. Um, so basically, I think it's mainly for word related tasks where people have this stereotype that women are better, actually. So if you ask people on, for example, solving anagrams and things like that, they will tell you women are better at this, right? And, and if you find a task where people have this strong female stereotype you you will probably not find a difference that is as big but the, the, i think the, the the interesting thing is right so I, i'm actually more and more a fan of just asking questions rather than doing these incentivized tasks because if you do the incentivized task it's always going to be it's going to be a binary choice it's going to be dependent on your confidence in the task on your experience with the task and so basically you know as i said right if we ask people in 62 countries right how competitive are you on a scale from one to seven then in, 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 in 61 countries, right, men say they're more competitive. Well, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I think, um, I think it's super interesting to show this, uh, that, it, um, that it indeed works or is, uh, is in line or correlates with the, um, with the findings in the lab that when we simply asked, but it would be interesting to see um, how this uh, correlation coefficient um, varies when you have different kind of tasks. I mean, the, the likes this mm -hmm. language task and so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that I really don't know. Yeah. No, I agree, but I don't know. Yeah. Thanks, Henrik. Other questions and comments? Alex, then dear. Yeah, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I really liked it. Oh. Okay. 
So uh, I was wondering whether you have data on uh, time preferences, because uh, this win at all cost may really correlate, or win at all cost, or uh, competitiveness may correlate with the, with the time preferences. Like uh, uh, I want to win now, I want to compete now, so I'm really more into present rather than into. Uh, yeah, no, I think no, we don't actually have a good measure of time preferences. I think. Mm, I haven't looked, so I, I, I would have to dive into the these list questions. So we didn't collect anything ourselves, but uh, I think if I dive into the list questionnaires, there's, there's some stuff on procrastination and things that could be related. You know, I'm somebody who, I'm somebody, who, so it's, yeah, no, I, so it's actually, some of the grid questions go in this direction, right? So like I do things immediately rather than letting them lie around and stuff, right? So I would expect to, like grit and conscientiousness to partially capture time preferences. But I don't know how well, right? Because they, there's a lot of questions there that kind of go in this direction of like, you know, I always do things immediately, right? I don't I don't procrastinate and things, but. Um, because, yeah. this, uh, it's, it's high profile, because these high profile managers, which are very competitive, they, even if you think about their incentives, they care about this year, this month, this, uh, uh, PNL uh, report, right? They don't mm. think really about the far future. So yeah, so you would expect managers to be more. In, so if you do like a classic time preference experiment, that they would they would be they would discount the future have more heavily than other people. Yes, that's what I think. Yeah. Actually, I'm not, actually, sure, I'm not so sure about this, right? Because people who discount the future heavily, they typically don't go very far in education. Yeah, but but this depends on the on the age because uh, yeah, yeah. you know when you when you become a manager, it's different than when you're just a student in the economics department. Yeah, and yeah. and generally speaking, I would guess student in the economics department could have different uh, time uh, preference than a student in I don't know history. Or something. Yeah, yeah. No, no, good. But yeah, so I don't know. I don't have a good measure of time preferences, unfortunately. Thanks, Alex. See ya. Um, yeah, hi, sorry, I'm not switching on my video because I'm a bit unwell, so I'm sure you don't want to see me. Right? <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, so really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you find that enjoyment of competition is the thing that differs most between men and women. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you have an idea about why that could be. So, uh, you know, uh, there are some papers that show that women um, tend to shy away from competition because they expect they'll experience backlash, you know, for exhibiting kind of male traits and competitiveness is one of these types of traits. So I was just wondering, because I mean, uh, related to the question that was asked right in the beginning, right, what can we actually do about it? So maybe enjoyment of competition is something that can actually, um, there is some intervention that exists that could, you know, improve women's uh, enjoyment of competition somehow. I don't know. So I was just wondering if you had thoughts on that. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. Maybe right. So, but I, so, so I think it's actually specifically one of the four enjoyment of competition questions is this negatively phrased one that says mm -hmm. I dislike competitive environments, and I think it's especially that one has quite a high gender difference. So, um, yeah, I, and and so, so so the difference is actually there both for young and for old people, right? So mm -hmm. that's also something we see in this in this uh, unpublished international data that I mentioned. It's it's actually not the case that. Uh, which is in a way astonishing, right? But it's not the case that that young people have a smaller difference than older people. So you'd think like young people, also in Western countries, right, grow up in a much more gender equal environment. And I'm always wondering about this backlash explanation, because I think if I, if I look at like how people treat children now, it's actually, I think it's almost the opposite, right? I think girls are ex being encouraged by everybody to go for it, right? And compete and yeah, it's so great. She's playing football. And boys mm -hmm. are much more, I think, almost like, if they become too competitive, right? Parents will tell them, at least many parents, right? Like, yeah, don't be so competitive, right? So, so I'm not, I'm, I'm wondering to which extent it is still true, right? That we're socializing, mm -hmm. 
will also be less competitive. So actually, so, so one thing that we do in this, in this, in this international data collection, we asked in every country um, how important, so we asked half of the people, how important do you think it is that girls are willing to compete? Right, like young girls, right? That we raise them to be willing to compete. And how important is it to raise boys to be willing to compete? Mm -hmm. And then in basically all Western countries, people say it's give much more importance to girls. Hmm. Right? It's not true in the rest of the world, but it's it's true in basically Western Europe, in, in the English speaking countries, Southern mm -hmm. Europe, it's true, right? So people consistently say much more important for girls, right? And yet these countries have the same gender differences in competitiveness as all the other countries, including and even higher for young people. Mm -hmm. So, so, I, I, so I, I mean, that's not a proof, right? But I'm not so sure how important this backlash explanation actually is. Right? Yeah, okay. Great, thanks dear. Henrik again, go ahead. Yeah, uh, second round. So uh, I've got another question that maybe it's a bit naive, but uh, but it's about the notion of competitiveness. So in in my initial understanding from the Nidal Westerlund paper, competitive meant to me um, the willingness to take part in in the competition. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, so. Part of your work um, indicates that it's also about um, a behavior within competition, like um, that uh, this this this, um, this need uh, to win or uh, the high cost coming from uh, from losing. So um, and these two concepts or interpretation of this um, this, um, this notion of competitive competitiveness, uh, they are not necessarily um, the same, right? Because you. You might want to shy away from competition, but once you're in, your desire to win or your your pain from losing might, uh, yeah, um, um, might increase your um, performance or effort or so on. So uh, um, I wonder if you could say something about this. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually interesting. So because that's something that we half expected. So so for enjoyment of competition, we were like, okay. Clearly, if I enjoy competitions, I should be more likely to enter a competition. Yeah, but if I'm somebody who actually really suffers from losing, I should be less, maybe even less likely. So I'm very competitive, right? In the sense of like, ah, I have to win this game if I'm in it, right? But maybe I'm just going to avoid games, right, or or competitions because because it's painful. And actually, we don't find this, right? So people say I find losing very painful. They're more likely to enter the competition than others. Let's oh. say so that 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 and that that to me a priori was not clear that that would be the case, right? Yeah. But but it, right. it it is the case, right? So that both of these types of people, and 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 yet, right? So both of these predicts competing, and then it. So I found it extremely interesting, right? That that then, but still, right? They are still different, right? So the one one group of people is happier, right? And the others. So that there is yeah. actually right. So if, if if you just divide people into four groups, right? So above and below and. Uh, above and below median on enjoyment of competition and above and below medium on desire to win. So the two are correlated, right? So the biggest group is the people who either say are high on both or low on both, right? But there's still, there's like 15% of the, of the sample who are above median on, 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 on desire to win and below median on, on enjoyment. And these people are actually miserable. Right. So they judge themselves as much less happy than the rest, right? They hate their careers. <laughs> They're like, so these people exist apparently, right? And, but apparently they still enter competitions. It's a... yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Henrik. I wondered about, you obviously you talk a lot about enjoyment of competition. Um, and is there, any way, is there any way in which enjoyment of the intrinsic sport itself or the activity itself fits into that? I mean, obviously, you know, I think about enjoying playing football, uh, for example. Um, I mean, I, I enjoy being an economist as well, actually. And maybe some people enjoy being accountants, that kind of thing. I don't know to what extent the concept of enjoying the the thing that you're competing in rather than enjoying the competition. Yeah. Is that a distinct thing or is that part of the same thing for you? Or Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. So, I mean, in a way, so we have this 
personal development motives, right? But that's not really, that's more like, okay, I, I want to get better at it, right? So I, 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 I want to become the best football player I can be, right? And, and the only way to do this is to compete, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know how to take these two things apart, right? So because in a way you, you cannot play football without competing, right? So I mentioned chess, it's the same thing, right? So I cannot, I cannot play non-competitive chess, right? <laughs> I, I can play against a computer, but still then I lose against a computer, right? But, but, but so, so I, my, my guess would be, right, that if I hate competition, I'm probably going to start enjoying activities that don't include competition. Mm. Actually, you, you can also, you, you can do sports that don't, where you don't necessarily compete against others, right? So you can go hiking or running or... Well, I was thinking about running because I run quite a bit, but then I'm competitive against myself, right? So I want to yeah, yeah. get a better time than last time or do something faster than I did. Yeah, so there are some papers that contrast competing against others against competing against yourself. And the two seem to be different. So for example, there's no gender difference in competing and willingness to compete against yourself. Hmm. But it's, it's actually so, so in hindsight, uh, it's actually something I regret that we, sh we should have maybe asked some questions about willingness to compete against yourself, right? I just want to, like, who's, who's, who is it that you compete against, right, in life, right? Like, do I want to outperform others or myself, right? And then maybe these people who say I enjoy competing, they're more people that just, like, also would want to outrun themselves, right? Whereas the desire to win people are maybe people that need to outrun others. But this is like pure speculation now. We've got time for one more question. If anyone has a question or comment, John Louis. Uh, do you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is following is regarding the numerical analysis tools you use. In that case, uh, of uh, not really causal analysis, but more descriptive analysis of relationship. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. whether you, did you try some uh, other methods like, uh, for instance, correspondence analysis instead of correlation, more traditional ones? Uh, well, you, you, you describe the relationship not in a causal uh, inference framework. Did you try that? No, no. but... But I think that's quite impossible to do, right? Because we don't, it's, 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 so the, the big issue in this whole literature, and that's not just competitiveness, right? That's this whole literature on personality traits and economic preferences, uh, on, on, you know, cognitive and non cognitive skills and so on, whatever you want to call it, is that you will never have random, random exogenous variation in, in personality. But these um, techniques have been developed not in a in a stochastic context, just for, to describe the, the relationship at the uh, to, to reduce the, the complexity of the data, just with a few uh, a few axes, but not in a in a random framework. Mm. So you mean things like uh, principal components analysis or something like that? Principal or correspondence, for, which is even less restricted, I think. Okay, yeah. Um, so what, 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 one thing that uh, so I'm, I, so I'm actually, there's something I'm thinking about doing in the future. So I played around a bit with principal components analysis, for example, with my data. Yeah. And then, but you then should you look, see, right, that, look that, at that, correspondence analysis too. It, it's correspondence. related. Okay, so yeah, I'm not familiar more, with that. Okay. It's more for a discrete uh, characteristic than a quantitative one in principal components analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it just yeah, okay, I'll have to look into that. No, no, no. I, 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 interesting. Thank you. Like, yeah, I, because I, I you, you can it, put, you can put, it. for instance, the variable, and in another, you can put, for instance, your countries, your classes. You have different uh, framework to use. Mm -hmm. I think it, okay. you should, you, you may, might have a look at it, at least. Okay, yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah, I will. Great, thanks, Jean-Louis. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, wraps our time up. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was, uh, as a number of people have said, uh, hugely uh, fascinating talk, very thought-provoking. Uh, 
uh, and great discussion as well. So thank you very much for that. And I wish you all the best in the development of your work in this in this area. Um, thank you. As um, yep, yeah, there's a bit of a bit of applause there. Teams applause from the crowd. Um, uh, as I hinted at the start, this is our last uh, session before Christmas. Uh, wearing my festive jumper, uh, so I uh, wish you all a Merry Christmas uh, uh, as we uh, as we leave here uh, and a Happy New Year. And we will meet next in the New Year, uh, January the twelfth. As yet uh, undetermined who will present, uh, and if you do want to present, then do let me know. Um, but either way, you will find out at some point in the next few weeks uh, who will give that first talk of 2024. But thanks again, Thomas. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and I wish you all Thank a you. great weekend, Christmas and New Year. Right. Bye-bye. Cheers, Thomas. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.